How's everybody doing? Fine. Good, Fine. good. good. I understand y'all have already been to a bunch of neat places. You've been to what, uh, Donaldson, Henry, and you're going Murfreesboro. to Murfreesboro. Where else you're going? Doing mm -hmm. Nashville. Yeah. Doing Nashville more. Okay. Well, good. Well, we're very glad that you came. My name's David Van Dyke, and I'm gonna be your host for ever the next time that we're together. The rest of the time that we're together. Uh, you all know it's kind of neat to have all Civil War folks because most of the time on the tour, sometimes I get. People don't know the difference between a mini ball and a good grade of wild honey, you know, <laughs> and a lot of them don't really care. And it's kind of interesting because sometimes we, uh, people have actually told me, well, y'all, you know, I came and, and you, uh, y'all talk so much about the battle. I'm not interested in the battle. And it was like, this is Civil War site, you know, that's what we're going to talk about. And I imagine y'all are more interested in the battle than you are in the uh, embroidery doilies and the and the cut yeah. crystal and that type of thing. Yeah, we're big on killing. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, uh, normally we try to we kind of split the tour uh, half and half uh, between talking about the family, going in the house, talking about the stuff in there, and talking about the battle. But if we'll take a vote, if everybody will agree, we'll kind of minimize the family stuff uh, except their involvement in this battle. And it's a fascinating story. But I may leave out some of the little little details about the embroidery samplers and things like that. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, that's what we're going to do. We stopped right here. The reason I did was this. You see that line of gravel right there? That is part of the original line. And guess what regiment, what Union regiment manned that line? The Chicago Board of Trade Regiment, also known as the 72nd Illinois. That line was broken. That line... 111th Ohio is right here, Sherwood's commanding. When that line is broken, about from the widow of Fifth end, imagine projecting that out to the main line. Sherwood refuses his left flank, kind of picks up right here. Jacob Cox tried three times to retake that line. Three times. The last time he brought the 112th Illinois from across the road over here, he tried to help take that line. He never did. So throughout the battle, the other side of the breastworks that were right there were under, under uh, Confederate control. And those men, you talk about being in a hot place. Those guys are taking not only fire from this direction, they're taking fire from this direction, from Sherwood's voice, from that line connect, reconnects over there, they're taking fire from this direction, they're taking fire from their buddies behind them shooting this way. That was a killing zone. But uh, there's our Chicago connection right there. First, where's the river in relation? To I've got some maps up there that can explain it pretty okay. well. The, the Harpeth River makes a horseshoe around right. Franklin. Right. It's very good because, <clears throat> you know, Cox was essentially commandant of the line. David Stanley argued that later, but uh, sure, uh, Schofield pretty much put him in charge of this line. And he, he, he's got a pretty good place to defend. He can anchor his left flank on the Harpeth River. It's about 500 yards over here. He actually anchored the, his right flank on the Carter Creek Pike, but then General Kimmel on over to the river. So the river makes a horseshoe as it comes around. Now I'll show you on the map. It makes okay. So, so he had a pretty good place to defend. Yes, sir. Since the last time I was here, this vista is new. Tell us about it. This is new. <clears throat> this is the guard, part of the garden spot. Mr. Carter's garden. He had about two and a half acres. Ran from here all the way to the road up there. And uh, you might, we have time to go down and read some of those signs. We're trying to replant some of the things that we know that he planted. Uh, see that little fence right there? From there to the road, the flower shop, and another building there, and a big parking lot. We have until the end of this month to raise $2.81 I believe, to purchase that. And we're pretty far close to, close to being. Oh, and I think we're going to make it. And I don't know if you noticed, but when you go back through the, the uh, uh, visitor center, look over the cash register, see that artist drawing there? Mm -hmm. We used to call it our dream, it's the plan, okay? Uh, we own a lot. We just started the destruction of Domino's Pizza last week. We had oh, that whole, hell, oh yeah, hell, and I'll hell, show you that. Uh, we own a lot next to it and a lot next to it and a lot behind it. We're hoping, we were hoping to rebuild a replica of Mr. Carter's cotton gin. Mm -hmm. As you know, y'all are familiar with the yeah. intensity of the fighting in front of that gym. Mm -hmm. Two of the uh, Confederate generals, we lost 14 generals at Franklin. Everybody thinks about the six that were killed. There were seven wounded and one captured. It's often called the general's battle. But two of those that were killed, Patrick Rowan Claiborne, 
Hiram Bronson, Granberg, both kill probably 30 yards in front of Domino's Pizza. Mm -hmm. So that land is ours now when I do that. You know, it belongs. It belongs Domino's would kill me too. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was going to say about the gin, well uh, we were, that was always in the plan to maybe do that. And at a little ceremony we had last week where they started the, the tearing down the, you know, they had a lot of dignitaries here. We had a, a gentleman here in Franklin that's a mover and shaker pretty much. Uh, his name's Calvin Lehew. And, uh, he met, got up and made a little talk, and he said, uh, his wife's name is Marilyn. He said, Marilyn and I have decided that we will fund the rebuilding of Mr. Clark's kind of gym. Oh. So that's probably about a $250,000, oh. wow. job. So wow. it's going to be there. All right. <clears throat> what I'm going to do, I'm kind of watching Jim to make sure he's out of the way. Let's walk up. I'm going to talk about the outbuildings a little bit, just kind of show you what they were, mm -hmm. kind of show you where the lines were, okay? And, uh, yes. Hey, this Okay, the berm. Good question. The berm. the berm is in approximate position of 44th Missouri, which is secondary retrench line. Really, I think it probably angled right there, but there wasn't much here. These boys didn't have enough time to do anything much more than throw their knapsacks down and get behind them, okay? Mm. This berm was built uh, in the 90s by some Eagle Scouts. It was an Eagle Scout project, and I decided to go put it on that side of the, uh, the side. But that's the approximate position of the secondary line. Mm -hmm. Went from here to battle on over to that. <coughs> Carter, the only one that's not original is that little cabin. It's correct period, as you can see, but it was moved here probably about 1964 to give folks an idea what slave quarters look like. It's going to be moved. It's not in a very good position being this close to the house, so it's going to be moved. To, we've got, oh, let me let me point this out while we're here since we're talking about land. See that old gym over there? Yeah. We got that too. All right. Oh, yeah, we've got that. We've got all the way to that street. And so what we're going to try to do, uh, that's coming down. In fact, I think they're going to start to have some next one. But these trees, some of they will be carefully thinned, so we'll have a you know open area. But there'll be some trees left, mm -hmm. and uh, we're hoping to recontour the land like we know it was. That's another beautiful thing about Fountain Branch Carter and Moscow Carter being surveyors. They had this land surveyed, so we can just about go out there and put a GPS and say it was such right here. And uh, so yeah, when y'all come back, when you come back next year, okay, <laughs> the visitor, we're going to have a new visitor wow. center by then. Really? Uh, yes. Wow. And so it's just, you know, it's a piece at a time, guys. Bit, yeah, and sure. and we have gotten, the, the sesquicentennial was a big booster for everybody. I'm sure y'all saw it in Stones mm -hmm. River, too. We had a lot of folks coming here. Uh, October, November of last year, between here, between the Carter House and Carton, we had just over 26,000 visitors really? in these two sites. And you talk about some old fellows running around with their tongues hanging out. But everybody had a good time. But it was a good it was a good boost uh, for mm -hmm. fundraising enough. For us. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm trying yeah. to talk. I'm a little bit hoarse. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. this side of the road was a little shabby. Twenty five years. Yeah, well, yeah. These are all slave quarters. No, no, that's just, just that one? yeah. This and is are... this is smokehouse in Mr. Carter's office. Oh. That's Mr. Carter's office. In the right location. In the right, correct location, and that's Mr. Carter's kitchen. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's walk on down just a little further. I'm going to talk a little more about it before we go in the house. Before you leave, I probably won't go as a group, but everybody walk between these two buildings and look at the bullet damage on the backs. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, that's why they, I say this building now has been designated as the most bullet scarred wooden structure still standing from the war. Let's just all go. Come on. <laughs> Once you mention it, they run away. Well, I, I, I kind of do that with my groups um, because I always run out of time. I look for their own. Some of these people were in the eye. Well, think, think about they're coming up. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of the fallers. Uh, look at the bullet. Look at the bullet damage on the back of these buildings with brick. Um, and you see ricochet damage off of here. Pull it down to you. Uh, this property now, guys. At the end of this month, we got that 2.8. Save, Save the roses, David. Save the roses. Yeah. Save the roses. Yes, we'll probably save the roses. This will be gone. These folks have been wonderful, though. Our property actually ends right there. They built this little garden and encouraged us to bring our folks back in here. So we have no hard feelings at them. But, you know, 
Yeah, and probably that building's going to be moved. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. I think. Yeah, I think that fence goes out to the road. So let's go back in. I want to show you where the dominoes is. Show you where the main line is. Well, outside the fence, there's a lot of traffic out there today. Let me say something brief about this fence. We're very fortunate that we have a lot of information, the family of uh, journals and so forth. And we know exactly what this fence looked like. And we had, we had it reproduced. And the, the neat thing about it, and there's such stickers for accuracy, the horizontal pieces are uh, uh, cedar, okay? Vertical palings are walnut. That's what Carter, that's what Carter said to have. So he's not that kind of expensive, but he said, well, just put something like, no. We're going to put wall, walnut and white brush. So I guess it's kind of, but anyway, we know that the fence was here. Uh, in fact, uh, my scout talks about them, a lot of them tearing down the fences. He had the number of feet of fence that was destroyed, part of the bill that he sent to the U.S. government. $25,000, I think he got $250,000. All right, as you look here, folks, see where the red uh, fence is down there, the construction fence, right there on that corner. And I'm not sad it's gone. That's where the Domino's Pizza was, okay? Two little markets in that little strip mall. That's gone. Main line came right along from Mr. Carter's cotton gym, angled back, picked up about this next street, Sprawl Street, started over in this direction. 104th Ohio, 50th Ohio. Okay, 72nd Illinois, left flank, connected right in here. Uh, that line would angle back like the way you saw with that main line. There. Secondary line, <coughs> the retrenchment, the barricade, and there's some there's always some confusion about this, but I'm pretty sure we've got it got it figured out. Cox ordered a secondary retrenchment, barricade. He, he couldn't barricade the road down there at Domino's. Remember, they got there about got here about 4:30 in the morning. He still got 800 wagons coming, and and 50, 60 cannon, 10,000 mules. He can't barricade that road down there. It's gonna make a that's a weak point in the line. So he dropped back, right here, and he wanted a secondary line, a retrenchment. It was a barricade that came across the road, out to the corner of Mr. Carter's office. On the other side of the office, that secondary line continued. It was not a barricade. It was actually manned by the 44th Missouri. There were four Napoleon 12 founders right there next to the smokehouse, right down there. The so this is the approximate position of the secondary retrenchment. The main line of hand runs across here, and I'll show you the map right there. Thank you, back to second division, third division. The breakthrough. <coughs> the breakthrough in Franklin. I was out here one day, it was about 200 of those. They were having a convention in Spring Hill. Woohoo! We went back to that. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, breakthrough. The breakthrough, when it occurred, was about from where we were down there. there at the end of that little fence, project out to the main line, and really just east of the road. The breakthrough on this side was closed pretty quickly. Uh, Cox has got some reserves over here. He's got the 12th, 16th, Kentucky, 8th, Tennessee, and they start moving forward pretty quickly. So it's pretty much... Uh, who was talking about Gordon being captured? Me. George, yeah. George Gordon was captured right about where Domino's is. In fact, he talked about the, the headlogs of the barricade. Well, actually, that's where the first Kentucky battery was. He was actually back there. Okay. Y'all will go in the house for a few minutes. Where, uh, I know Updike came out to plug that gap. Where was, where was Updike? Yeah, Updike, <coughs> Updike's brigade was located about where Piggly Wiggly is now. It's about 100 yards over on the other side of the hill. Now, what Emerson Updike's brigade did, really, was by enough time for the rest of the force to move forward to. You had a lot of the troops that fell off this line, off the main line in here, when they see up that counter charge, they start moving forward. Some of the men that were coming in off of Wagner's line, I found a man in the, in the 100th Ohio that was wounded to Franklin. But guess what? That brigade was out in the front of Wagner's line. Yeah. And so if he was wounded, he was probably wounded right up there where we came in. A lot of those boys rallied and came back. So I'll kind of show you where that's going to be. You had a question. The purchase of the flower shop is all the way to the next street? It's all the way to Straw Street. If we get that property, excuse me. 
when we get that property. I said if, but when, uh, and gets that cleared, then we'll have a clear view all the way to the, the federal front line. Yeah. Uh, no, that, yes. No, it's okay. No, that's the spot that's going to be See that green sign, Straw Street? And that's okay. okay. We may get the rest. By no. All of Schofield's men, the 800 wagons, are all in Franklin. Schofield makes a bad, uh, makes, finds bad news. <laughs> the highway bridge across the Harpeth River at the foot of the, the turnpike going to from Franklin to Nashville is down. He also learns that the Potton's brain that's, that General Thomas was to send down here to build a Potton bridge across is not here. While well, he puts his engineers to work, cutting down the approaches so they can build a new bridge, they'll plank over the trestle that carries the railroad across the uh, Harpeth River. And that is covered by the people that went over to Fort Granger that was built to cover that bridge. So, if the, if, the, if the highway bridge has been an attack, the Potton Bridge had been here, there would have been no battle of Franklin. But Schofield would have crossed and started toward Nashville. So, he, uh, tells General uh, Stanley, halt Wagner's division here. Remember, Wagner is the rear guard. So Wagner's division is going to halt here, and they're going to face that way. Why? Because that's where the Confederates will be coming from. They're not going to be looking toward Wagner. And there they will remain to probably three o'clock in the afternoon when they learn from cavalry that the Confederates are approaching. So Wagner will take his men, move north along the Columbia Pike, and you and you're going to see where Wagner is going to hold his men. As you follow the Columbia Pike, you've got heavy traffic. There you can see a large sign. And that is where you have that short grade that goes up and gains about 50 feet in altitude. And there, Wagner halts his division, and he tells uh, Lane, you take position west of the road. Conrad, you take the, uh, the area west of the road, he should have said, for Conrad Lane, uh, east of the road, and run for your artillery. And he tells Emerson Updike, I want you to form your men in reserve. Updike says, probably thinks to himself, that stupid fool, I'm not going to form my men here. They're tired. We haven't had any sleep in 36 hours. So he takes his brigade, continues northward, goes by the Carter House on his left, the Lot's House on his right, and 
200 yards north of Lot's house, he halts his day. And they go into camp. Because he can see, I don't want my men up here. Three quarters of a mile in front of the defenses. Suppose the Confederates get us panicked and we start retreating. My men are going to be in a bad way, just like Conrad and Lane are going to get about 4.30 in the afternoon. The hood arrives here about 3 p.m. He comes up here where you folks are. Now there, is, there are very few houses on either side of the Columbia Pike. That's the street you're looking down. That's the one you see the heavy traffic. You're out in the country. You are not in a, a strip, strip area that is built up. You're here in 1864. You don't really get any houses on either side of the Columbia Pike until you get to the Academy. The Academy is on the same side as the Carter House, 200 yards north and south of the the Carter House, you have the house, you have uh, Mr. Uh, you have the brother Car uh, Mr. Carter's office, you have the kitchen, so there are four buildings still remaining. Then, for I pointed out to my bus, and I'm sure Jim did, where the Domino's Pizza Hut was. And that is where Mr. Carter's cotton ship is. Very, very important. So, Claiborne arrived, uh, so, Hood is studying this. It is not. In the distance, where you can see that water tank on the hill, that's Roper's Knob. The preservationists, about 15 years ago, bought Roper's job. See the water tank? Mm -hmm. And see the knobs right to the right of it, to the left of it, or to the right. That's Roper's job. He talks to General Forrest. Forrest is very familiar with the area. Forrest had been here from early April 1860. Uh, three to the period of mid June 1863. He had been here at Franklin, he had been at Brentwood, he had been at Spring Hill, he had been <coughs> at Columbia. In fact, at Columbia on the night of June. That's where he killed Gould. <coughs> so he knows the area pretty well. He knows they are fords that you can cross the Harpeth River upstream from the River Chester. He knows they're fords downstream where you can cross. He knows. There are three roads leading into Franklin south of the river. There's a Columbia Pike that you can follow with your eye. There's a Lewisburg Pike which we entered by the railroad track. And there's a third road that you if they cut these damn trees down <laughs> coming in from the southwest. And Forrest is going to say, 
I think I can handle the Union Cavalry. I've handled them well before on their retreat and our advance from, uh, from uh, Florence. <laughs> and I beat the I beat the crap out of them on the twenty on the thirtieth. When we cross at Huey's Ford. And even if Wilson is with him, I think Wilson is a phony. And he says, let's have a meeting. So uh, this gentleman has put a, an X on his map. Find Winstead Hill on your map on page 30 and put an X about two inches from Winstead Hill. And there's the Harrison House. So they decide to go to the Harrison House. Who's going to attend the meeting? Is Hood, Forrest, Cheatham, Stewart, and S.D. Lake, and various staff officers, including Camel Brown, who is General Jules' stepson. Camel Brown is on the staff. So they meet down at the Harrison House. And Forrest is going to open the discussion. He says, give me a good infantry division. And I will cross the Harpeth River at a ford that I know where it is, Hughes Ford. Supported by that infantry division, and by cavalry, I will press. I will press the Union cavalry to one side. We lick them before. We can lick them today. And he says, "I'm not worried anything about James Harrison Wilson. I know more about Wilson than Forrest. I know that Grant is there only because he's a Grant protege." And if Grant turned a sharp corner, Jimmy Harry Wilson would break his nose. <laughs> he's reported he, because he's a friend of Grant's, he's been promoted to the focus. And Forrest uh, Wood says, I'm not really convinced you can do what you say. And he said, uh, I'm not going to give you an infantry division to cross the river upstream at Hughes's Ford and attack the Union cavalry. Forrest will send cavalry across, but he has no infantry. So the main attack is going to be made with infantry. Now you got now when Hood when Pickett made his attack at Gettysburg, the artillery barrage that precedes it from by either 172 guns or 162 guns last for 75 minutes. The Confederates only have one battery here, six guns. Think of the difference between 162 cannon. We're going to hammer the Union line at Gettysburg for 75 minutes before Pickett's men step on. Hood only has six guns. Most of them are back on the road with Lee's corps. And Cheatham, Stewart are not really impressed <laughs> with Hood's idea. <laughs> Forrest is damn right angry about it. 
the play. They'll come back up here again around 4 o'clock and again Hood will study the area through his glass and he's going to say let it be a fight here. So the decision is now made. The Confederates are going to commit 19,000 men. Take it at 11,200 men. So this number of men is going to be almost double the number. Everybody in his aunt knows about Pickett Pettigrew's charge. Until maybe 15 years ago, nobody knew about this charge. And I'm talking about Eastern historians. Uh, I'll use one of, the, one of Sam Hood's remarks about our friend Wally Sword. These modern historians that think that Hood, uh, that a uh, thing that is 65 <coughs> years old, before anybody's ever heard of, when Hood was on Rodney and Whistler. So we're going to form. So uh, General General Loring, excuse me, General Stewart will form his men about 500 yards further from the river than you were at when you were at Park. That's going to be all. What happened? What Loring will be on the extreme right. When you were at Carton, he would be a third of a mile further to the south. Three divisions. On his left will be Walthall's division. And on Walthall's left will be French's division. With the uh, only two brigades. Then, west of the uh, east of the road, you can now see them, east of the road, is going to be Cleveland's division. On Cleveland's left, commanded by Hiram Bronson Granbury, will touch the Columbia Pike. On Granbury's right, will be a man that has his great-great-grandfather in that painting, the fighting preacher, Mark Perrin Lowry, and support Bowman. On the other side of the Columbia Pike, probably a half a mile from where we are, Brown will deploy his four brigades. And Bate will deploy his three brigades on Brown's left. Well, by four o'clock, Hood has said, let it begin. Now, unlike Pickett's charge, they're going to be taking their bands with them. And they're going to step off. The battle line is roughly a mile and a half in length. Roughly 19,000 men. As they get closer and closer to the area, as we look from here, and where we can see that sign, the front of it, you see some buildings with white. 
that's where we have the two brigades of Conrad and Lane. And they opened fire. The Confederates are about 200 yards off. The Confederates go down, but they don't stop. <coughs> the second brigade volley doesn't start them, stop them. The Confederates. And then, just as Emerson up there's Conrad's men and Lane's men, head for Franklin as fast as their legs can A half a mile from where we start running is Carter's Cottage on the west east side of the road. On the west side of the road is the Carter House and the outbuilding. The Lot's House is on the same side of the road as is the Carter Jet. Now the Union line is going to have an opening for the passage of the wagons down, in, uh, down the Columbia Pike. There's going to be a zag in there. Now Riley's men, you guys that have the, uh, the Atlas, Riley has two regiments armed with Spencer repeating rifles. The Confederates start screaming, shouting, probably even like you would be a baseball game. Follow them into the lines. Chase them. Keep the bastards running. And they run all the faster. So what do you have? Bring in the advance of Flavor's division. Bringing the left flank of Brown's division. What do you have? 2,500 panic-stricken men. If you open fire at them, at the Confederate, who are you going to kill? And they're going to follow them into the woods. From an area just to the, from the cotton gin to the Columbia Pike. West of the Columbia Pike, of the area up of the Cotton Chin, and 50 yards from the Carter House, extending to the area where the visitor center is. And the center people are going through that gap they've left in the line. They're going to advance, probably beyond the Lot's house. And fortunately, we have, a, we have Riley and his two regiments of men armed with Spencer rifles. And you have Emerson Updike, you see him on your map, with five regiments. Emerson Updike is where he is, with the innocent said, the writer, I ain't going to do what you tell me to do. If I had stayed on the advance line, my men would be running just as fast. But he said they pressed him. And he's going to lead them forward. And the Confederate line advance surge is going to stop. Now in Gettysburg, Armstead and 300 men get across the angle. They stay there less than 15 minutes before they're either dead or prisoner. This time, the Confederates are going to be there for a half hour. So the battle can go any way. But, Updike and uh, and Riley's men stopped them, and step by step, they forced the Confederates back. So they closed the breach. In the sure surge, 
Claiborne's horse has been killed. He borrows another horse. It's gunned down. He goes forward a foot at about a hundred yards from the cotton shed. He'll find Claiborne's body chopped through the heart. Over on the Columbia Pike, he'll find Granbury dead. Over near the River Trestle, they will find Adams, who has been cultivated, who has been catapulted. Well, I say you do. At least you're not Pete Brown sitting here watching. Like this. <laughs> and the horse is shot. The horse is astride the Preston. Legs on one side, front legs on the other, and Adams' body has been cut all the time. And for the next four hours, the Thunder on one side of the breastworks and the Yankees on the other will fight for everything they have teeth, hands, rifles, and they'll continue to ten. Uh, 10.30 when the fighting ceases and the attack has been stabilized. As soon as it's stabilized, Cox gets orders for get down here. When the Confederates wake in the morning, on the, the 31st, on the first day, they're gone. One thinks he's won a victory, but he has lost one third fourth of the start. And he decides to press on and we'll focus at that tomorrow at Nashville. Now I've got the sign of 